Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter by chapter, verse by verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. And we're going to, our subject today is going to be elect. Now, this is soon after we did the lecture on pre existence. So it was good groundwork. So it's a good time to redo the track on elect. What is the elect? The elect church. A lot of people don't know, well, what was the elect and what is the elect? Well, that's why we're going to discuss it. you got to remember that our father, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, had a piece of paper in his pocket that said he could persecute the Christian church all he wanted to. And something happened. There was no revival meeting he went by that he volunteered, but he was struck down by the hand of God and God stated in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, this is my chosen vessel. Why did God do that? That's a little unfair. Man that would write most of the New Testament. He hated the church. It's a thing that you must remember, and as I stated, preexistence uh, lays a good groundwork for this because it's what he did during the rebellion of Satan for all souls come from the Father. We have both ends of the spectrum. We have election and we have free will. Now why do we have free will? Those that failed during the overthrow, they're God's children and He loves them. Thus the elect, God utilizes the elect and the very elect, that is to say, to accomplish those things that are written or at least to set them in motion. They're called the servants of God. He will use those that have free will once they choose Christ to accomplish things as well. But the election is a good subject. Let's open our Bibles, if we may, to Isaiah chapter 65, and let's capture the frame as best we can on this subject of God's mind. How does our Father feel about this? All right? Chapter 65, the great book of Isaiah, verse 1, and it reads, God speaking, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me. That means look at me. Behold me, two times for emphasis, unto a nation that was not called by my name. In other words, salvation, the ten tribes, they didn't know who they were. Judah has always known who they were. But they were supposed to follow his advice. And when they kind of lost their way or got confused, uh, so it is. Think about it. 2, verse 2. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. And many times that's what happens to you. Not that you're not to think for yourself, plan for yourself, but you need to consider God's thoughts as well because He has set forth a plan that tells us how to be successful. Keep patience and you always will be, uh, be successful when you follow the plan of God. Verse 3, a people that provoked me or actually insulted me. When I, as it stated there in uh, verse 2, as I hold my hands out to them all day long, saying, I'll, I'll save you, I'll help you. They insult, provoke me to anger continually to make my, 
to my face, right, right in my face. They insult me right to my face. They sacrificeth in gardens. Now, gardens is a word for paradise and pretending to be heavenly, all right? And burneth incense upon altars of brick or clay instead of paying attention to the golden altar. Verse 4 which remain among the graves, the tombs, and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh, and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. They, they claim to be servants of God, and they're not even familiar with the health laws. What a mockery, what an insult, right in the face of God. Verse 5, which say, stand by thyself. Come not near me, for I am holier than thou. These, do you know what God thinks about this? Hey, stand away from me a little bit. I, I, be, I be holy. I be Christian. Well, you're not a Christian if you act that way. You're only, it's only a pretense with you. God doesn't like holier than thou self-righteous hypocrites. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Day in and day out, they keep up their same religious junk while eating swine's flesh and drinking broths of the abomination claim to be holier than one of my people. I think you're kind of beginning to get the point that God isn't happy if you don't do it His way. Many might say, well, wonder why I'm not blessed. Well, do you do it his way? Because if not, you're like smoke. What, what do people do when they have smoke in their nostrils? They blow it out. Rather than blessing, he blows you away from him. He doesn't want anything to do with you under those set of circumstances. I don't know. It's just up to people, you know. Uh, the parable that we utilized concerning thanksgiving where the Pharisee and the publican went up to the altar and the publican says, I thank God that I'm not as other people. I thank God that I'm perfect and not as this sinner here. And of course, it was the sinner that God blessed because the sinner was honest with God and asked for mercy. He got it. You can't play church with our Father, all right? It just, it won't fly. And if, quite frankly, if you're biblically illiterate and not familiar with his word, you know how to please him, to be on the good side of his emotions, to be a child that he is proud of. That's, that's my child there. I'll just bless that child today. I'm, I just really love him the way he or she follows me. At least they try. I love them, and I'm going to bless them. You know, you, you want to think a little bit. God has the same emotions that we do, only more so. Six, behold, it is written, it's recorded before me. I will not keep silence, but will recompense. I'm going to punish even recompense into their bosom. I mean, they're going to get the full measure of punishment. Sometimes people, God get, grabs them and begins to shake their little old lives up a little bit, and they say, I'm the unluckiest person in the world. Bad things just happen to me all the time. And they don't even recognize it as the chastisement of the living God when they should be saying, thank you, Father, I understand. They get on a poor me, baby jag. Verse 7, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together are also, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the mountains. Therefore, will I measure their former work into their bosom. Again, in the Hebrew, a, a figure of speech idiom that means full measure. They're going to get, they're going to get both barrels. All right. And that's not that he's going to blow anybody away. It means that they're going to get both barrels of his nostrils blast as he snuffs them out of his presence. It's not a good place to be, my friend. Not a good place at all. Verse 8, that is to say, in the wrong side of God. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, 
In other words, you go along and you find Yayan in the cluster. There's some good grapes out of the whole bunch is what he's saying. And one says, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servants' sakes that I may not destroy them all. In other words, out of the whole vineyard of my children, God being the vine, every once in a while along comes a good bunch of grapes. And I, I'm going to take care of it, he states. It's the first fruits, beloved. It's God's, you know what, the subject we're talking about. Verse 9, And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, both houses, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And um, uh, an inheritor of my mountains and mine elect. Do you underline that word? Mine elect shall inherit it, and my servant shall dwell there. In other words, my plan is perfect. I have this plan, and it's going to work exactly as I have it planned. And of course, the elect <clears throat> are those that he has justified, which we'll document here in a moment. Therefore, he can interfere in their lives as he interfered with the life of Paul on the road to Damascus and not have to worry about it on Judgment Day that he gave Paul any great break because Paul had already accomplished his breaks as he was with the Father at Satan's rebellion. All of God's children were with him. Our souls all come from our Father. And I hope that certainly you recognize that fact. What, what is this word elect in the Hebrew? In the manuscripts, the word that God actually spoke, what does it mean? It's bakir. And it comes from the prime 977. It means to select. And of course, the King James translated to choose, chosen one, or elect. But I want to go to that prime. I want you to see the prime that bakir comes from. It's bakar. It's a primitive root properly to try, because they were tried. God didn't give them something for free. They earned bakar by being tried and found the true group of grapes that he would utilize, knowing they were children that he could count on, that he could depend upon in any battle against Satan that they would adhere to God's word rather than the words of men or the, the religious practices of traditions of men. That's God's elect, the true church. Verse 10, let's go just a little further. Now he opens the gate for salvation, if you would. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks. And the valley of Achor, do you know what that word is in Hebrew? The valley of trouble. The valley that a lot of people have trouble in, a place for the herds to lie down in. For my people, I mean, they have sought me. Have you? I don't know. That's all it takes, friend. That's why God's elect are sent, is to teach the true word of God. And a people that hears that truth and have eyes to see and ears to hear, even in the valley of trouble, even in the time of trouble, even in Jacob's troubles, we'll have peace to lie down and rest. Why? We have a protector. We have a comforter. And that comforter certainly works on our behalf. Verse 11, But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, Zion. What happened there? and in prophecy what shall happen there, that prepare a table for that troop. Do you know what this word is in the Hebrew? Gad. And that furnish the drink offering unto that number, mini in the Hebrew tongue, mini, mini, shekel. Have you heard of it in the book of Daniel? One being the God of fate and the other the God of destiny. People's own trumped up religions. They support it. They support the religious groups that are leading people to the spurious Messiah. That's what he's saying. Verse 12, Therefore will I number you many, destined you, better said, 
to the sword, and ye shall all blow down, bow down rather to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. People don't really like to hear God's word, the vast majority, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That's God's calling. They won't answer, but thank God for that cluster that does. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. In other words, your fate is certainly not good. If God is unhappy with you, you've got problems. There's only one way you receive blessings from our Father, and, and he, has, he, he has more blessings than you could ever consider. Turn with me to John chapter 15. I mean, he owns everything. And why people want to fight against him and be on his bad side when he knows everything is beyond me. It really is. So God does have that cluster. He calls it his elect, those that he has already tried. In other words, they, didn't, they weren't given it. It's because they earned it. Think of it. Think of it. You'll remember Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, where God said, I chose you before the foundation. How is that possible? Because the word foundation is overthrow, Satan's overthrow. Okay, the teachings of Jesus Christ we find written in John chapter 15. You'll remember we were talking about the cluster and time not to... We won't take the time because you're all familiar with it. This is where Christ said, I am the vine and you are the branches. My father is the pruner. He takes care of it. If you don't produce fruit, sorry, branch, lob it off. Don't need it. What good is it for if it doesn't produce fruit? All right. And then there comes that one that takes the pruning or the correction from God and does produce fruit. Thus, I want to pick it up in the 15th verse as he speaks to the good, uh, those that follow. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. I mean, a servant just does what he's told. But I have called you friends. He's done what? Called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Wow, how did he do that by this word? Have you read it? It is written. Do you want to be called a friend of God, or do you want to run around in some baby bottle, milk toast Christianity? All you have to do is just learn salvation God didn't know what he was doing. Yes, he wrote the whole book, but you don't need it. You need me, your reverend, to teach you if, to keep your little baby bottles warm. And all you have to do is say, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. You can say you're saved all you want to, but if you hop in bed with the Antichrist when he comes soon to say, I've come to fly you out of here, you got trouble, friend. You are not saved. Do you know what Jesus Christ will say to you? Get out of my sight. I never knew you because you did not, did not learn the things as a servant should that could be called friend instead of servant because you know what God's plan is. And the only way you can know that is to be familiar with the Word of God. He makes it known to us. I don't know. Our people in a high-tech generation when high-tech has exploded since 1970. Just, I mean, it is amazing where we've gone in communication alone. Computers, so forth. And, and here, theology, you still got those baby bottle-sucking Christians, not even potty trained, running around saying, I'm saved, and not and biblically illiterate, never caring enough about our Father to get into His Word. If that stings, wear it. Verse 16, I do it in love. That's my job, is to teach God's Word. 
And I love those clusters that love to hear it. Verse 16, ye have not chosen me. Whoa, what an interesting statement. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. You could even say foreordained if you like, that you should go and bring forth fruit. I don't know, do you? Think about it. Uh, those that do get God's blessings, all right, that bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. That's blessings, friend. Not servant, friend. Because you're familiar with our Father's plan of salvation. As people, especially in the generation that is counted for a generation, His election, Christ's words on the cross in Psalms 22 and the last three verses of Psalms 22. To that generation, those that will produce fruit. Yeah? Many times today, controversy and persecution can follow teaching God's Word, but who cares? God is judge, not they, all right? And with that, let's go on over, if we may, further in the New Testament. Let's go to 1 Peter. That great fisherman that God so loved that he sent the Son to him and said, I want to talk to you about religion. I want to know if you're saved. Did he say that to Peter? I think not. I think not. He said, follow me. And I mean, Peter was off and running, a servant that would be called friend. Okay, uh, Second Peter, uh, First Peter rather, chapter two, verse, I'm gonna go to verse six and eight so that you know who the real first fruit and who the first elect was. Verse six, chapter two, First Peter. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. You know what that means? It's written, do you know? Behold, I lay in Zion, I will pronounce it in Hebrew, a chief cornerstone. Do you know who that chief cornerstone is? Elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Never will they be confused. If they believe upon him, then they will believe his word if they're not ignorant about it. But if they serve him, they're gonna know what the word is because they're gonna dig it out. Verse seven, unto you therefore, which believe he is precious, do you? Or is he just a milk bottle warmer to you? But unto them which be disobedient, that won't study his word, that will fall off to the first Jesus that appears, fly out of the field, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And you know what it becomes? Verse eight, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word. It's important that you absorb that, beloved. What causes people to stumble? Ignorance of the word. If the word causes you to stumble, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed, certainly weren't chosen. In other words, it's very simple. Well, how could Jesus be a stumbling block? If you follow the flyaway false Christ, the false Jesus, then the true Jesus, and you're trying to follow him, became a stumbling block for your patience in not waiting for the true father through the son would jump in bed like Jezebel with the spurious Messiah. And hey, it's no big deal because many churches today teach in Matthew 24, oh, blessed Jesus, this one is taken from the field first and I just am so ready to go. She was taken by Antichrist. That's the subject and the object of the Greek manuscripts. Think about it. Thus, the true Christ becomes the stumbling block for the one that's unlearned and stumbles at God's word because they're not familiar with it. I, I want, while we're here in 1 Peter, drop back to chapter 1, and I want to read verse 2 to you. 
This is who Peter's writing the letter to. The apostle of Jesus Christ, the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, so forth, that's to say the uh, scattered ones, the tribes, elect, verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Do you know what the foreknowledge of God is? Do you know what elect is now? Tried through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. To the church, God's elect. Well, I didn't know God's elect were the church. Well, who in the world did you think was the church? A bunch of flub-ups? That's what the word means, those that are tried. And of course, there is the free will church. And I pray that those that have free will, that see fit to choose the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, thinks enough of Him that their words and the Father's words will mean enough to them that they will get into them to understand the plan so that they don't, they're infallible as far as the stumbling block is concerned. I don't know. That's up to you. Elect. That's who he wrote this book of Peter to the elect, that church that is elect. Well, what's its name? Elect. God uses them. They're his force on earth. They're his good cluster. And they're not going to be ripped off by the spurious Messiah, as it's written in Mark 24, or and I'm sorry, Mark 13 and Matthew 24. They're too solid for that kind of nonsense and they find it an abomination. Christ would say, see that no man deceives you in both Matthew 24 and Mark 13. He warns us of the deception of men. Well, how do I avoid deception of men? By knowing what is written. It's that simple. Because from that comes the blessings of God. Elect, never heard of somebody being pre-chosen. Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah real quickly. We're going to buzz here and cover as much of this as we can. And again, I think it's very timely that we do this so soon after teaching pre-existence. It makes it a little simpler. Would God choose someone before he even was in his mother's womb? Is that what you're trying to say when you say elect? Well, what does the Bible say? It's written I hope and trust that you're not biblically illiterate and that you're familiar with it. God speaking concerning Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, verse 5, to Jeremiah, Behold, I, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Do you know what that means? Do you know what's formed in the belly, the womb? I think so. I knew you before... You were ever in your mother's womb. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained, there's that word again, foreordained thee a prophet unto the nations. In other words, naturally, Jeremiah preexisted. When God created the souls, he created all of them. He was with him. I don't think any Christian would argue with the fact that all souls come from God. And God doesn't play favorites. You earn it. Verse 6, Then said I, O Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. The word means youth in the manuscripts. I'm just a young man with no experience, God. Verse 7, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. Say not, I'm a youth. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. That should remind you of Mark 13, the chapter we've had reference to, when God's elect are delivered up before the synagogues of Satan, when the fools have already jumped on his bandwagon, rapture it out of here, ready to go. That, well, do you call them fools? I did not call them moros in the Greek that Christ told us not to. But don't you agree it would be foolish for someone to jump on Satan's bandwagon? I think so. I think we could call them fools. Verse 8, Be not afraid of their faces, 
for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. That's why you can teach God's word boldly and without apology, because he's with you. He blesses you. Did he not say concerning the stumbling block that if you need anything, you ask for it and Oppa will provide it? Have you ever wondered why, as an example, this ministry doesn't have to say, oh God, if you don't send money today, we'll be off the air. Oh God, if you don't, if you want us with you, pay up, pay up. We're gone, we're doomed. If, you know, if God wants us here, we'll be here. Why? He's with us. We don't have to beg. God doesn't send out beggars. God sends out men and women and children of God that teach His Word, and that is sufficient because God's elect will hear the Word of God. Those that with free will that love the Lord will hear, and God is with them. All right. Um, so uh, we see then in verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. You know, you want to always keep the clay, which is what our bodies are a little moist. The clay still works pretty good. If you get self-righteous, it's so brittle it breaks when God touches it. Remember that. 10. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. What, what is a man of God supposed to do? To root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build uh, and to plant. And that's what servants of God do. They plant with the truth. They plant with the Word of God. For the seed that was sown in the parable of the sower was the Word of God. And the Word of God will cause people to stumble, and they stumble at the Word. Thus a teacher should be teaching the Word of God, whereby no one stumbles that has eyes to see and ears to hear. Now, let's go to the book of Romans real quickly here. Book of Romans, subject election, God chooses. God chose Jeremiah before he entered his mother's womb. Why? Because he was a champion in the battle against Satan. What about election? Could God choose someone? Not before they earned what they wanted. Okay, Romans chapter 8, verse 26, and it reads, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. This speaks to God's saints set aside one's elect. Our weaknesses, we're all weak in the flesh. He helps that. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We do not know absolute. God does. We know the plan and the season. He knows absolute. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, that's sighs, which cannot be uttered. He knows things that we're not to know behind the scene. 27, and he searcheth the hearts, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit, of course, because he maketh intercession for the saints, set aside ones, elect, according to the will of God, according to God's purpose. Verse 28, and we know that all things work together or happen uh, for, uh, together for the good to them that love God. Do you love him? To them who are the called, there's that word again, called according to his purpose. Not somebody else's, not some tradition, not some uh, fleeting thought by some so-called wise man, self-righteous hypocrite, or some bottle warmer of the baby milk, but the word of God, his plan. The word that you do not stumble at if you possess it, because then you have the seal of God, which is his truth, in your forehead. Let's go with the next verse, 29. For whom he did foreknow, there you have the word, he also did predestinate, just as he did Jeremiah, just as he did Paul on the road to Damascus, just as he did Peter when he said, follow me to be conformed, similar that is, to the 
image of his son that was first fruits by first fruits, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And of course, the elect, he intercedes in their lives that there may be many more that would hear truth and their eyes be open. 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Didn't, there was no volunteering. He called, and whom he called, them he also justified. That means he judged them and found them not wanting. And whom he justified, judged, them he also glorified. Call them his election. Verse 31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I mean, it doesn't matter. God is judge. We don't care who is against us because we have the victory in the word of God. His election, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. That means election, free will, everyone. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Do you need something to do God's work? I trust you're not biblically illiterate if you want to do God's work. That'd be kind of foolish to say, I I'm going to be a, I'm going to do God's work. And you don't even know what God's plan is. That's like saying you're going to be a, surge, a brain surgeon and you've never had any training. God's Word is, is high tech, though it flows with the simplicity as it was spoken by Christ. Why? Because it's common sense. 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. You don't have to worry about somebody laying some charge against you in persecution. Who cares? If the truth hurts them, let them suffer. They'll heal up real good from it and maybe learn something. But God is the one that judges you. 34, who is he that condemneth? It's God. It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. He's sitting there on the throne at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Right at the right hand of God, when you're doing God's work, when you're producing fruit for Him on the vine of Christ, then certainly He intercedes for us and we always win. Don't have to beg, don't have to do many things that some people do and are extremely blessed. Why? If we need something, we ask for it. And it's going to be utilized for God's purpose and it happens. God is true to His Word. Can you be true to Him? Do you love Him enough that you care about what He said? You see, that's what the Bible is. That papyrus that was written upon, that papyrus that has come forward down through the strain of time, so important for you to love your Father enough. You don't if your earthly father had written you a letter of instructions, would you read it? You know, when you really loved it, I think you would. Well, that's what has happened here. It is the word that makes you ready. And some of you have known since you were a child, there was more to God's word than you were being taught. Then it's very possible you could be one of his election. It doesn't make you any better than anyone else. It just means that you have work to do. Think about it. To stand against the spurious Messiah. Okay, we're going to pick up the subject elect in the next lecture. Don't miss it. Listen a moment, won't you please? Free introductory package. Say this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? 
This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. All right, bless your hearts, there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, if we may, 1-800-643-4645. And that number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Won't you do that? Um, naturally, we can no longer answer all questions, but who knows, the handful could be yours. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world at this time, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Got a prayer request? He's your father. You don't need a telephone number. Talk to him. It's his letter that he's written to you. Spend some time each day in it and thank him for the letter whereby he may bless you, lead you, guide you. Father, touch, prosper, knowledge, Father, heal in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, let's see what people have on their minds. We're going to go to Lynn from California. Where does it talk about in the Bible that there are two in the field and one is taken and one is left standing? Matthew chapter 24, and the one that is taken is taken by the spurious Messiah. Christ went to the great detail to say, if they tell you here is Christ or lo, he's there, don't go. But this old heifer just can't wait. She jumps the fence and she's off and running right out of the field. The one that's left standing is still doing God's work waiting for the true Messiah. Why? Because she knows from God's word that the true Christ doesn't return to gather us to him until the seventh trump as it is written. Patty from Texas. You don't have to worry about flying away with us because you won't make it. Well, Patty, toodaloo. I'm so glad I'm not going to make it. I'm wiser than that. But, honey, you have a good trip, won't you? You enjoy it and have a good day while you're there. All right? They high from California. When you are thrown into the lake of fire, do you stay there forever or do you burn to nothingness? Well, they, how long, when you, and bear in mind, we're talking about soul bodies here, spiritual, not flesh. When your soul burns into nothingness, how long is that for? It's forever and forever. All right? Figures of speech, metaphors are so difficult for man at times, and yet it says so much more if you listen. So, um, actually, the answer to what happens in the lake of fire in as much as God is the consuming fire is answered in Ezekiel 28, verse 18 and 19, when it tells you what's going to happen to Satan forever and ever. Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. TD from Michigan. I'm in a church that teaches the rapture theory. I'm thinking of walking away. This is a life and death decision for me. I hold I think we're given a lot of information. I think I will not give them and tithe heavily to them. All kinds of things have been happening to me. What should I do? I want you to read the second epistle of John, of, uh, John. not St. John. In the three little epistles that John has written, I want you to read the second one, and I think from God's Word you will get your answer. If someone teaches a message other than that that Christ taught, if you much as wish them God's speed, you become a partaker of their evil deeds. Could be why you're having problems. I don't know. I can never tell. I, God has purposes for some people being in certain churches, but when you become aware that you could even be aiding the enemy, then that's time that God is saying you need to make a change. Well, I tell you what change? No, I won't. You have to make your mind up. God could have you there for a purpose. It doesn't sound like it. Sounds like he's brought a conviction upon you. You're the one that has to deal with it. As a teacher of God's Word, I can only say, read the second epistle of John. 
and let the word decide for you. Sandra from Texas. I just received your MB package. That's the Mark of the Beast tape uh, that we give free to one-time listeners. Uh, first time, one, a gift, all right? One time to everybody that wishes. And I want to thank you for your honesty, your teaching, and teaching. For the first time in my life, I understand. Thank you and bless you. Well, that really pleases me. That that's, makes my work, um, that, that is, um, makes me feel very happy that God blesses us with gifts of, of uh, His Word. Thank you. Okay, this is Gary from Oregon. I would appreciate your thoughts in regards to the way a person should be buried. Cremation is the cheap way, but I heard that it is written somewhere in the Old Testament that this is wrong. No, someone's, someone's pulling your leg. It's not written that that is wrong. It is written in Ecclesiastes, that's the Old Testament, in chapter 9, that when this flesh, it's speaking there of the flesh body, that when we're through with it, it's not remembered anymore. You can't teach it anything. It's gone, it's done, and it's forgotten forever. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Bear in mind that Ecclesiastes is written to the man that walks under the sun. That means the flesh man. And it is the book in God's Word that teaches us how to be happy and have peace of mind in our flesh bodies. But then in chapter 12, verse 7, he lets us know that instantly when the flesh dies, that the spirit, which is the intellect of the soul, meaning the soul, returns to the Father that gave it, and this flesh returns to dust. Now, it doesn't matter. All cremation does is expedites the trip, all right, a little bit. It doesn't matter. We're through with it. The spiritual body, the inner man rises. Flesh doesn't. All it is is organic matter, clay God formed, and we feed it from foods that um, are uh, organically um, grown of the soil, by the soil, for the soil. So back to the soil it goes. And then just think, it becomes much richer, all right? Uh, Janice from Florida. In Revelation 7 churches, two of them received favor by God. What happens to the people in other churches? It's, it's individual then. And um, I see a note here concerning your uh, condition. Don't, don't ever worry. Uh, you know, it is God that judges, my dear. No church can judge you. The other churches, those that are in them individually, can still overcome even if that church dies. And quite frankly, I hope you noted that the two churches that did overcome, that he found no fault with, taught who the Kenites are. That was the thing that they had that was synonymous. So you've got nothing to worry, nothing to fear about. Hey, kick the dust off your feet, honey. Hold your head up and say, thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Because I'll tell you quite frankly, sister, he has, and you may not even be aware of it, best thing that could have ever happened to you, all right? Now serve God with all your heart and mind by his word, not some Bible written by men and tumped together, but by the manuscript. Sharon from, Shavon rather, from Connecticut. My question for you is, um, well, Anytime a young person makes a mistake and they are ignorant of the full consequences, then there is no sin as far as God is concerned. They, it is forgivable and you're not accountable. That is scriptural. You go in peace and serve God and don't ever worry about it again, all right? You're free. Uh, Lenora from Georgia. Are children born are children born out of wedlock lost? Now, it's th th there's no sin upon the child from the parents unless it's a mamzar, as it's written in Deuteronomy chapter 23. And I'll let you check that out in your Strong's Concordance. All right, no sin upon the child. 
as far as illegitimacy is concerned, it is what the child is that can will, um, but in Christ all have the ability to be saved as it is written in Deuteronomy 23 in the first three verses. But to have the full understanding, you'll have to take the word or the title of that child back to the Hebrew. Liz from California, does forgiveness mean that no matter what people do to us, we have to put up with them? Absolutely not. We're not walking mats. Christians are first class citizens. And we are told in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 that if some knucklehead keeps doing what they're doing, I will put it that way, that is against God's word, you, our brother, it states, said, you set that sucker off to one side and don't have anything to do with him except correct him and let him know why he's not welcome in your home and so forth, all right? It's, it's very biblical. We're supposed to stand up for ourselves. Joe from Minnesota, what do I do in order to have the seal of God in my forehead? Boy, that is the, what is in your forehead? Your brain. What do you, what's the seal of God? His word. All you have to do is absorb it. That is to say, not memorize it word from word or verse by verse unless you're going to be a teacher. Um, and then um, you should uh, understand the plan and that is the seal of God. Why was Satan told when he came to this earth as Antichrist in Revelation chapter 9 that he could not touch those that had the seal of God in their forehead? They're not ignorant. If you know God's word, you know Satan, and rather than finding him tempting or following him, we bristle and make ready for the Holy Spirit to tell us what to do, and we do it. We cut it because we're can-do type people, and Satan cannot do a blessed thing about it, as it is written in Revelation chapter 9. So get cracking. Be patient. Study as you can. Everybody has different al alphabets as far as being able to absorb, but go at your pace. Laverta from Kansas, how can I find how many times Jesus gave thanks? I use the Strong's. Is this written down anywhere? Well, I've never been asked that question. You gotta re your Strong's is a good way to do it, but you've got to remember that sometimes, oftentimes, like the feeding of the multitudes, the thanks you would have to count as only one time, say like from the two or three books that report it. So, and, and, and that's a good way, you'll do fine, okay? Janet from Ohio, why did Jesus tell Mary not to touch him after he had risen from the grave? Again, it's a figure of speech. It's, it means don't hold me up. I've, I've gotta to go to the Father. He still gave her instructions to warn the others that he had risen and that he would be where he had told them before the crucifixion, he would meet them. Uh, Gator from Florida, Joshua 927. Is this where the Nethanim began to work into the temple services? Is this where they got their foothold? Yeah, it kind of is. And you know, it's a strange thing, uh, Gator, that in what chapter is it in Joshua? 23. In chapter 23, God tells um, the uh, Joshua and the priesthood, hey, I'm cleansing this temple, this, these priests, one more time. And that is it until the end of time. If they want to go bad, if they want to go false, they're going false. I won't touch them with a 10-foot pole. Well, I added the 10-foot pole, but he made it pretty final, okay? He's not going to touch them. And the Nethanim just took over. Uh, John from New Mexico, Ezekiel 32, land of Magog.